Welcome to section 10.8. Okay, gentle people, we're going to start off with a quiz question. So here's an equation, and I want you to try to predict the sine of delta H with just this given information. Okay, gentle people, what you'll notice here is that I have a reaction, and what's important here is you count the number of molecules on each side of the reaction. If I go ahead and look at my reactants, I have two and one, so I have three moles of gas. And if I go ahead and look at my products, well, I just have two moles of gas. And so what we can think about is, is it more disorder to have three things or two things? Three things can lead to more disorder. There's more arrangements, more microstates with three things than there are with two things. So that means in this particular reaction, I'm going from three, which has more entropy, to something with two with less entropy. So that means my delta entropy is going to be negative. I'm going towards more order. So a couple of things when you make predictions concerning reactions. When you go ahead and make more stuff, that is going to be more disorder. So in this case, since I'm going from one thing to two things, the delta S is greater than zero because there's more disorder on my product side. But what's more important here is the states of matter. Like we mentioned in our last lecture, Gases have a ton of entropy associated with it. Gases have way more entropy than a solid. So if I were just going from a solid to a gas, this would also have a delta S that's greater than zero. So let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit. So what I want you guys to notice is that delta H, delta S, and delta G are all abbreviated with capital letters. And the reason for this is that these are all state functions. Now remember, a state function, I don't care about the path. And if that's the case, then Hess's law applies to each one of these. So I told you guys about this equation right here. We can calculate the delta H for reaction. If I take the delta H of formation of my products and subtract the delta H of formation of my reactants. I can do the same for delta G. If I look up the delta G of formation of my products and subtract the delta G of my formation of reactants, what I will get is the delta G of my reaction. Now the same applies to finding delta S of a reaction. I can take the sum of my products minus the sum of my reactants. But the one thing that you should note, if you look up thermodynamic values, you won't find delta S you will just find S. And here's the reason. We can measure entropy. We cannot really measure enthalpy and G Gibbs free energy because this really is something that needs to be a change. I need a starting point and an ending point. And so that's why these things are relative to each other. And you'll see delta H and delta G. For entropy, what we have is a zero entropy state. And that has to do with the third law of thermodynamics. The third law of thermodynamics says that if I take any material, make it into a perfect crystal, and put it at zero degrees Kelvin, the entropy of that is zero. Because there is only one microstate, one way to do that. And if there's only one way to do that, there's no disorder in that system, that is the lowest entropy that I can achieve, zero entropy. As soon as I start raising the temperature, my entropy is going to be a positive number. I can measure that entropy because I know what my baseline is. I know what zero entropy means. Now, for the next couple of sections, we practice these ideas out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover one type of problem that has to deal with Hess's law and state functions, and then we'll see other problems later on. So remember this idea for the next couple of lectures. So here's what I want you to do. Let's go through example 10.3. 
here's the premise of the problem, here's some thermodynamic data, and what I want you guys to do is mark the right answer after you finish doing this problem. So let's map out what this problem is trying to do. I'm going to start out with water at 50 degrees. And what I want to do is take it to steam at 150 degrees. And I'm doing this at constant pressure at 1 atm. So the first thing I need to do is I need to heat up my water to its boiling point. So I'm going to call this first process delta S W. And what this does is it's going to heat up my water to 100 degrees Celsius. Now, when I'm at 100 degrees Celsius, I need to do a phase change. I'm going to change my liquid water into gaseous water. So there's an entropy associated with this phase change, and this is the entropy of vaporization. Anytime I take a liquid to a gas, I call it vaporization. So I'm going to turn that into a gas. And again, remember the temperature is the same during a phase change. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to raise the temperature of this gas. So again, remember, if I increase temperature, I'm going to increase my entropy. And so I'm going to call this delta S G. And what this leaves me with is a gas at 150 degrees Celsius. And so what I want to know is I want the total entropy going from 50 degrees Celsius to 150 degrees Celsius. Now, because delta S is a state function, I can add up all the steps and I can calculate the total entropy. And so what that means is I'm going to take the entropy of heating up water. I'm going to add it to the entropy of vaporization. And I'm going to go ahead and add it to the entropy of heating up a gas. So let's take apart each one of these things. Now, the first one is the entropy of heating up liquid water. Now, what you guys will note is that this is at constant pressure. So I can use the formula NCP ln of T2 over T1. So I'm going to simply enter in each one of these values. So N is the number of moles. So I have two moles. Now remember, Cp is the molar heat capacity. And I'm not dealing with an ideal gas here. I'm dealing with a real substance water, and I gave you that data. And in this case, it's 75.3 joules per Kelvin per mole. Now the last thing is the temperature. So I'm going to have the natural log of T2 over T1. Now, I want you guys to be careful. This is derived from the ideal gas law. And so T2 and T1 have to be in Kelvin. So T2 is my final temperature. So that's 100 degrees Celsius, or I add uh, 273 to that. So that's 373. T1 is my initial temperature, 50 degrees, but I have to add 273 into that to get it to Kelvin. And so I get 323 here. So if I crank out the math to this, what I get is 21.7 joules per Kelvin. All right, let's do the next entropy calculation, which is the entropy due to vaporization. So what you guys can do is you guys can look on your information sheet and what you guys will see is the entropy of vaporization is the enthalpy of vaporization over the boiling point, Tb. Now, we didn't formally derive this equation, but you guys will note that we did derive this equation where we said delta S equals Q reversible over the temperature. Now, remember, Q is going to equal delta H if I'm under constant pressure. And remember, T is going to be the temperature at which I do this process, which happens to be the boiling point. So that's how I derive the equation. But what we care about is how we can fill this equation out because you are given it in your info sheet. So let's put our delta H of vaporization, which I gave you in the problem. That's going to be 40.7 kilojoules per mole. 
and let's put our temperature. So this is happening at 100 degrees. Remember, there's no temperature change at a phase change. And remember, I should go ahead and put this in Kelvin. And so this is going to be 373 Kelvin. Now let's go ahead and crank this out. And I'm gonna do a conversion uh, during the calculation. I'm gonna go from kilojoules to joules. And so what you should get out of this equation is 109 joules per Kelvin per mole. Now you'll notice in our last problem, our units were joules per Kelvin. So we should try to get this into joules per Kelvin because that's what usually Delta S is measured in. And so I have to get rid of moles. So I'm gonna go ahead and times this by two moles because that's what I prefaced in the problem and that will get rid of moles. And this leads me to 218 joules per Kelvin. All right, let's do the last entropy calculation, which was me heating up gas. And again, it's gonna use that same formula we used above, NCP ln of T2 over T1. So again, we have two moles. Be careful because the CP is going to change depending on the state of matter that you have. So if I look at the molar heat capacity for gas, it's 36.4 joules per Kelvin per mole. And again, we got to put our temperatures. So the LN, and so we're going to go to 150 degrees Celsius plus 273 to get it in Kelvin. So that gets us to 423. And again, 373, which is the boiling point of water in Kelvin. If I go ahead and do this calculation out, I get 9.16 joules per Kelvin. Now what I can do is I can add all these values up, just like I stated at the start of this problem. So the whole process from going to 50 degrees all the way to 150 degrees is going to be 21.7 plus 218 plus 9.16. And if I calculate this out, this becomes 249 joules per Kelvin. Well, I hope that made sense. And remember to stay safe, Chem1B.